What's going on people, today we're theorizing how Attack on Titan would have gone in a completely different direction if Urban was the one chosen to inherit the Colossal. In case you're new to the channel, I'm going to start this video off by doing a quick recap of this whole alternate timeline so far, but if you want even more details then I just recommend watching the first 4 parts of this series. Okay, so back in part 1, Levi made the decision to inject Ervin with the transformation serum, enabling him to eat Bertolt and become the new Colossal Titan. Following that, the commander fulfilled his lifelong dream of learning the truth about the outside world, and alongside everyone else, he realizes that their true enemy is the most powerful nation on the planet. Knowing that Marley would eventually return for the founding titan, Urban spent months rebuilding the Survey Corps with the intention of making them into an army that could fight against humans as well as titans. In the year 851, Yelena and Onyankopon then arrive on the island, and thanks to certain information that they reveal, the commander would see a chance to take down Marley by forming an alliance with Hizuru in the Middle East. In order to make this a reality though, he'd first need to take a gamble and work with the volunteers, which is risky considering their close relationship to the Beast Titan. The following year, Ambassador Kiyomi then takes a trip to Shiganshina, where Irving convinces her to go behind Zeke's back to form a new agreement with him. In this new deal, Paradis agrees to give her access to a chunk of their natural resources in exchange for Hizuru providing technology and assistance in his plan to beat the Malians. Moving on to part 2, this one begins a couple years later in the year 854, at a time when Mali was still at war with the Middle East. Despite the ongoing conflict, the four warriors were temporarily recalled back to Liberia, after Willy Tiber received credible evidence that shifters from Paradis had infiltrated the continent. With Peak, Zeke, Reiner and Porco all being back home, this gave the Middle Eastern forces a massive boost, and more importantly it laid the foundation for Evan's plan to dismantle the warriors. On one particular night, Zeke invites his comrades and their families around for dinner, where he offers them a suspect amount of wine. And as everyone makes their way home, this is basically when the new war begins. During the rest of the video, Eren confronts Reiner in his home before blowing the place up, Irvin wipes out virtually all of Molly's highest ranking officers, and Zeke betrays Pete by trapping her underground. Part 2 then comes to an end with Reiner and Porco being captured by the scouts, while Flock is transformed into a pure titan so that he can become the next armoured. However, before it can happen, the Warhammer makes a surprise interruption, as it turns out Willy had secretly sent her to Liberio in case she was needed in the fight against the Colossal. This brings us to part 3 which was by far the longest video in the series, and in this one both sides took massive losses. For a start, Reiner's mother was confirmed to have been crushed by Eren, while Peek's dad and Porco's parents were turned into pure titans by Zeke. The Beast Titan then uses them to defend himself from the Warhammer, as Mikasa repeatedly attacks it with Thunder Spears. At the same time, on another side of Liberio, Peak manages to escape from our underground prison, but in the process kills Hanji, Nile, and a few other scouts. Her and Magath then link up and run towards the sound of Zeke's scream, but by the time they get there, the warriors have already been defeated, with Flock eating the armored, Eren eating the Warhammer, and Louise being selected to eat the Jaw Titan. Peak then watches on as Jean blows up her dad's pure Titan, and a second later, airships arrive from his route to collect the Survey Corps. Over the next 12 hours, the scouts then split into different teams, and with the help of his route's army, they destroy tons of Malian bases, including Fort Salta. Unfortunately though, Jean gets ambushed by the Cart Titan, and following a brutal interrogation, Peek and Magath learn that Zeke's royal blood is the key to unlocking the Founder. After executing Jean, they then bring this intel to a grieving Willy Tiber, who understandably wants revenge for the death of his sister. The three of them then come up with an intricate plan to strike back against the scouts, although for this plan to work, they decide that Marley first needs to surrender to the enemy. As you can imagine, this surrender has major political ramifications all across the world, and over the next 7 months, a ton of things happened that were explained in the part 3 video itself. For the purpose of this recap though, there are just 3 main things we need to mention, with the first being that Evan betrays Zeke and has him locked up miles away from the walls. Thing number 2 is that Hitch is selected by the MPs to inherit the female titan. And finally, number 3 is that Willy uses his political influence to form an alliance between nations who were afraid of the new Eldian Empire. In part 4, this global alliance then launches a surprise attack on the island, with Pete confronting the Beast Titan and eventually eating him as revenge for Liberio. It should be mentioned that Flock, Levi and Irvin tried their best to stop this from happening, but by the time they arrived at the prison it was already too late. Simultaneously, in Shiganshina, hundreds of pure titans were dropped into the district, forcing Eren to reveal himself as he tries to protect the population. Mikasa and the other scouts then join the fight as well, and after briefly hesitating, Hitch also decides to help out the attack titan. Sadly for her though, Magath was perched on top of Wormaria inside an anti-titan cannon, and as part of his mission, he's allowed to kill any shifter except the founder. For that reason, he strategically shoots the attack titan's brain to prevent Eren from moving, and this is followed up by him blowing out Hitch's nape. 
By aiming for this specific area, he instantly crushes her human body, and this was all witnessed by Historia and Louise who were inside a nearby fortress. Part 4 then comes to an end with an exhausted Urban about to be eaten by the new and improved Beast Titan, but just as she's about to deal the finishing blow, the commander is suddenly teleported to the past dimension. At first, he has absolutely no clue where he is or how he got there, but within a couple seconds, he's approached by a sulky looking Eren, who reveals that his story is the one that did this. With that said, that's basically everything you need to know from the first four parts, so before we dive into part five, I wanted to give a shout out to you twos for sponsoring today's video. You twos make these amazing collectible figures for pretty much any series you can think of, and recently they sent me a couple of designs from their Attack on Titan range. If you head on over to their website, you'll see there are a ton of other characters as well, and for me personally, the ones I'm probably going to get next are the Colossal Titan attacking the walls, and also maybe the Attack Titan. Of course, they also have literally hundreds of other limited edition collectibles, ranging from memes to games and to other popular series like Stranger Things. If you're interested in getting one for yourself or as a gift for someone else, then be sure to check out the link in the description, and thanks again to you twos for sponsoring the channel. Okay, so part 5 starts off back in Shiganshina, directly after Hitch was killed by Magath's anti-Titan cannon. As we know, Louise and Historia were nearby watching the whole thing, and with the female Titan being dead, Eren being paralyzed, and Ervin nowhere to be seen, these two couldn't afford to keep standing around doing nothing. In the current moment, there were still hundreds of Titans rampaging through the district, creating a genuine risk that the founder might be eaten if even one of them manages to slip past the scouts. For the sake of the island's future, Historia would realize that if Eren dies, then so does everyone else, and it's why in a moment of desperation, she'd explain to Louise her last ditch solution to save him. Meanwhile, on the outside, the Global Alliance would be closely observing the situation, as the Survey Corps struggled to deal with a huge amount of pure titans. Assuming this continues, then it's only a matter of time until the Alliance can steal the founder, so for now, all Magath has to do is just keep aiming at the attack titan's brain. However, around 10 minutes later, Willie would start to get suspicious, as down on the ground, a worn out looking Historia would slowly be stumbling through the streets of Shiganshina. Directly above her, Mikasa would be slashing any nearby pure titans, almost like she was clearing a path for them to reach Eren. From Willie's perspective, a move like this wouldn't make any sense, since he received intel confirming that Historia is just a normal person, who Eren would have never allowed to inherit any titan abilities. That intel was reliable as it came from the same spy who gave them Zeke's location, but despite everything, Willie could see those unmistakable titan marks under her eyes. Based on this, he'd instantly tell Magath to shoot to stop her making contact with Eren, and although the commander would want to do it, there's a good reason why he'd hesitate. Of all people, Magath is clever enough to realize that if he kills her now, then there'll be no more people of royal blood left on the planet, and if that happens, then the founding titan can never be activated again. This is a big problem for him, since for Molly to reclaim their place in the world, they need access to this power, which is why they secretly had plans to capture Historia after they captured the founder itself. Killing her now would also kill Molly's one hope of regaining the dominance they used to have, and this brief hesitation is what gave Connie time to catch Magath by surprise. As the commander's body evaporates after being hit with a thunder spear, back on ground level, an exhausted Historia lifts her finger towards Eren's titan foot. This faint contact between the founder and a titan of royal blood immediately teleports them both into the past dimension, where they manifest in front of the coordinate. Initially, Eren would be the most confused about where they are, because although he's obviously heard about paths, he's never seen this landscape for himself. By contrast, Historia is the one who does already know this place, given that five years ago she saw visions of the coordinate through Ymir's memories. After a short awkward silence, Eren would then turn to ask her how they're able to get here, to which Historia replies by explaining what happened in Shiganshina. With the survival of the entire island on the line, Louise made the ultimate sacrifice by passing down the Jaw Titan to summon of royal blood. Before Historia can even finish the story though, Eren interrupts her to ask her why she would do this, since in his opinion, Mikasa and the scouts could have handled the pure titans. From his point of view, this was a pointless sacrifice of Louise's life and more importantly, Historia's life, because from this point forward, she only has 13 years left to live. As he continues to lash out, suddenly a young girl emerges from the coordinate itself, forcing them to temporarily switch their attention. Although Historia wouldn't have any clue who this mystery girl is, for some reason her memories would flash back to the time when Freedy was teaching her how to read. Back then we saw how one of her favorite book characters was a girl called Krista, and in the present day she get the feeling that somehow this girl is connected to that particular memory. Soon afterwards, the girl in question would then kneel down to Eren and Historia, causing a surprised Eren to respond by asking who she is. As he then kneels down to put his hand on her shoulder, something pretty interesting would happen, as all of the founder's memories abruptly begin flowing into his head. For that split moment in time, the two of them would gain an almost complete understanding of each other, with Eren experiencing her pain and acknowledging her desire to be freed from 2,000 years of slavery. 
Slowly getting back to his feet, he'd explain to his story that this girl is the original founding titan Ymir, and due to her obedience to the royal bloodline, his story is the only one who can use her full potential. A revelation like that would be totally unexpected, but after taking a minute to process, his story would wonder what Ymir can actually do. It's likely that one of the first things she'd ask is whether Commander Irving can be summoned to this dimension, partly because she'd want his guidance on what to do next, but also because she'd want to know what happened with the mission to save Zeke. This request from Historia is how Irvin ends up manifesting out of the blue, and it wouldn't take long for them all to fill each other in on what's been happening. During the conversation, the commander would learn all about the chaos in Shiganshina, including the deaths of Hitch and Louise, while Eren and Historia would learn about his situation in the real world. With Irvin literally about to die as soon as he leaves this dimension, he'd make it clear that before that happens, they need to think of a plan to save the Eldian people. This leads to an intense discussion about their strategy going forward, with the characters having different perspectives on how to use the Founder's power. In Eren's case, he'd propose that now's finally the time to do a full-scale rumbling, where they can unleash the Wall Titans to trample all life outside the island. A global massacre on this scale would guarantee that future generations would be able to live in peace, and it would also mean that they no longer rely on titan powers for their survival. Eren would argue that the outside world has taken the lives of so many people they care about, including Armin, Jean, Hanji, and countless others, and so the only way to stop this cycle of death is to put an end to everything. Immediately though, Irvin would disagree, partly because the full scale rumbling would mean wiping out their allies. Over the past 5 years, the Azimabito have held the island in a ton of different ways, and if it wasn't for their resources, the scouts never would have been able to beat the Malians. On top of that, Eldia has an existing peace agreement with one of the smaller Middle Eastern nations, with the commander believing that larger countries in the region might be convinced to do the same. To him, the idea of destroying their potential allies with the rumbling would be a pointless waste of human life, and instead he proposed that they do a partial rumbling to crush the global alliance. Once that's done, the entire world will know the power of the founder is real, and from there, Eldia can use diplomacy to establish themselves on the world stage. On this issue, Historia would also fully agree with the commander's approach, since if successful it would save the island and give them a voice in the international community. However, Eren would aggressively reply by claiming that Eren's plan can never work, because their supposed allies have already betrayed them. Back in Shiganshina, he noticed how the anti-Titan cannons used by Magath were exactly like the ones produced by the Middle East, and when it comes to Zeke, his secret location was discovered by the Global Alliance, even though the Asma Beta were the only ones outside the island who knew. In Eren's mind, this would be proof that no one outside the walls has any loyalty to Eldia, and their allies won't hesitate to betray them if it serves their own best interests. A worldwide rumbling would therefore solve this problem by creating a future where none of their enemies exist, and in this moment he turned to Historia to ask her why she doesn't understand. The queen would respond by telling him that she wouldn't be able to live with herself if she killed billions of innocent people, and just as she says those words, the surrounding environment would begin to change. Thanks to Ymir's power, Historia would transport the three of them into her own memories, where she'd reveal that since arriving in Paz, her head keeps flashing back to the time she spent with her older sister. As we already know, Frida was objectively the kindest member of the royal family, and was the only one who took the time to visit Historia during her terrible childhood. Years afterwards, when Historia herself then became the queen, she tried to emulate her sister by opening an orphanage and spending time with kids who had no other family. In that sense, it was Frida who showed her how to be the person she is today, and Historia would believe that if Frida was in her current situation, there's no way she'd ever agree to Eren's plan. Following that comment, there'd be an awkward moment of silence where he just quietly stands there thinking, before suddenly the environment abruptly morphs into the Rice Chapel. This rapid change would catch both Irvin and Historia completely by surprise, but for Eren, he'd just start talking again as if nothing happened. Out of nowhere, he'd admit to them that five years ago at the meadow ceremony, he saw a vision of the future through his dad's memories. That future vision was unlocked specifically because he touched Historia, and now in the present day, Historia is the one that's brought him back to Paz to relive the whole moment again. As the three of them observe from a distance, they witness Grisha arriving to confront the royals, while Frida's conflicted mind gets taken over by the will of Karl Fritz. Seeing this takeover happen, Eren would claim that if Frida had never been brainwashed by the king, then she would have done anything to save her siblings, even if that meant activating the rumbling. He'd argue that although Historia might not want to believe it, the real Frida was determined to save humanity by eliminating the titans, so if she knew that their true enemy was humanity instead, then odds are she'd want to eliminate them as well. Seconds later, as Grisha falls to his knees in hesitation, Eren would forcefully tell him to stand up, and thanks to the Attack Titan's future memory inheritance, Grisha in the past would actually receive the message. In this way, Eren is able to motivate his dad to wipe out the Rice bloodline, while the helpless Historia can only watch on as her family are massacred right in front of her. 
When the carnage finally comes to an end, Eren would begin to explain that from the time he made contact with Ymir, he understood the Founder on a personal level. This understanding made him realize that to free Ymir from this prison and to save the Eldian people, the rumbling is the only option left for them to take. As he continues, he'd go on to confess that Historia never really had control over the Founder since the vow to renounce war applies on some level to any person of royal blood. In the main series, Zeke confirmed this when he said it took him a mind-numbing amount of time to override the vow and make Ymir obey him. And in this timeline, Historia simply never had the chance to do that. Consequently, Eren chose to let her believe that she was in control because he wanted to test if having the Founder's power would give her the same realization that he had. Despite his best efforts though, neither she or Urban was convinced by his plan, forcing him to go ahead with this by himself. As the three of them then materialized back in Paz, Eren would begin walking towards the coordinate while Urban and Historia would be chained up by Ymir. Unable to move, Historia would scream at Eren not to go through with this, since ending all life outside the walls isn't exactly the only solution to Eldia's problems. Meanwhile, Eren would try to break free from the chains around his wrist, but in this case his conviction wouldn't be strong enough for him to actually escape. Although he'd agree with Historia that a full-scale rumbling is wrong, he'd also realize that stopping Eren at this point would put the whole island at risk. Being commander of the scouts, he wouldn't want his final action to be one that potentially dooms the Eldian race, and for that reason he'd stay in chains as Eren keeps walking towards the paths. Instantaneously, a giant lightning bolt would then strike the attack titan in the real world, while across Eldia the three walls would start to crumble. All over the country, unsuspecting civilians would be crushed by the falling debris, as the millions of Colossus Titans emerge for the first time in over a century. At the same time, the rampaging pure Titans in Shiganshina would be struck by lightning as well, and when the smoke finally clears, every last one of them would have reverted back into human form. Remember, these people were just innocent Eldians who were blindfolded and brought here by the Global Alliance, and so most of them wouldn't have any idea about where they are. To save their lives and the lives of his fellow scouts, Eren used the Founder's power to undo every transformation in the world except for himself and his army of Titans. This single action is what turned them back into humans, and in a nearby forest it also had some pretty big consequences. With Urban back in the real world and literally about to be eaten, the Cart Titan would get hit with a bright flash that engulfs her entire body. This lightning would be so powerful that the blowback knocks the scouts off their horses, and in the chaos it'd definitely take a few minutes for them to understand what just happened. Just like in Shigatchna, there'd be thick smoke covering the whole area, but as Erwin cautiously begins to walk through the cloud, he'd be stunned to find Peak's broken body on the ground. With that said, that is the end of part 5 of What If Erwin Got the Colossal Titan, and if you want the series to continue, then be sure to drop a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Until the next one, peace out.